Most people would argue that customer service isn't rocket science, but I think it begs the question, if it is that easy, why do so many companies get it so wrong? Before you can start thinking about giving good customer service, you first of all need to know and understand your customer. First of all, what does the customer want? Secondly, what do they expect? And thirdly, just as equally as important, is what they don't want. Customer Service Workshop is designed to help the attendees come up with some different strategies to answer those three questions. Customer service is so important for a business because the probability of selling to an existing customer is far greater than selling to a prospective customer and the costs uh, of retaining an existing customer is far lower than the costs of trying to get a new customer. Welcome to everyone to the customer service workshop. First of all, I'm going to ask a question. Is there anyone here that doesn't have a customer? Put your hands up if you don't have customers. Good, you're all in the right place then. <laughs> and obviously, when, when we talk about customers, we, we, we're talking about not only your external customers, um, but also your internal customers, your, your colleagues that rely on you to provide them with information or an internal service that allows them to service the external customer. So why are we here today? A few reasons. To try and get some uh, base information and get you sorted and ready and enthused about your next set of assignments. There's a mandatory, obviously, the managing improvement. That's the mandatory one. There's an optional one there, managing customer relations. Some of you might be doing that. There's another one about management communication. So a lot of what we're doing today is going to feed into that and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail further down. I'm hoping you're going to pick up some ideas around customer service that might uh, add value to you. Um, and if you don't, you'll at least have a jolly fine time networking over lunch, so it's still going to be worth you turning out. So our goals today are about this, making sure that you're going off feeling reasonably confident about your next assignment and you can get those done, improving your awareness and understanding, and maybe your understanding being able to identify now both your strengths and your weaknesses, and we really hope that you have a really good day. A wise man once said, if you make good products and services, and service them well, you will make your fortune. I think this diagram is quite a handy little diagram to show where customer service fits in in, in your organisation. So often it's marketing that will find the revenue, sales will generate the revenue, and customer service will protect the revenue in your organisation. And your, the, the whole knowledge about the customer sustains that revenue. If I'm going to McDonald's, would I really want them to take care of me like they would take care of their grandmother. Oh, come in, Mr. Wynn, come in, have a seat. You know, what can I get for you today? No, no, I don't want any of that. I just want something quick, fast, correct, and vaguely polite. It all depends on what your customer actually wants. And a lot of today is gonna to be about understanding and knowing your customer, helping you to think of some different strategies around that. Because there's three main things I think that you need to know with your customers. What they want, what they expect, and that can be different to what they want. And also, equally as important, is what they don't want. Because you may be giving them something that you think is good, but actually they don't want it. And that's quite an important thing to remember. Knowing your customers, your products, your service, and your service arrangements must be available in the right quantities and locations to the quality required and at the prices they're willing to pay. Now, you're going to have different types of customers. Some will be apostles, probably not too many, but they think you're the most wonderful company in the world. They won't have anything bad said about you. They're going to stick with you no matter what. Hands up if you've got any customers like that. Oh, good. Good, some of you have. Next ones are loyalists. So they've got a strong affinity to you and they're going to stay with you as long as you maintain and support that loyalty. So they're loyal to you and you give them loyalty back in terms of good service. Next ones are mercenaries. They'll do business purely on an economic basis. Happens a lot in the print industry. Uh, either your prices will be lower than the next person, next company, or perhaps your quality is the best and your prices are the same. Hands up if you've got mercenaries. Yeah, all of us, unfortunately. Browsers, another type, and they'll use you out of interest or happen to be looking at things you sell. They might just try you every now and again. And the last type are terrorists. <laughs> and these are customers who perceive themselves to have been badly served or badly treated by you. 
And what they're after is nothing other than to seek to tarnish you with a bad reputation. And I have to put my hands up, I have been a terrorist. Now, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that at an airport, but I have been a terrorist. <laughs> so one of the, the, the first things that um, I would recommend is to understand what categories your customers fall into so that you can start to begin to think how to manage them. So, have you got any terrorists? If you have, address their concerns before they damage your reputation. Your loyalists that you've got, how can you turn them into apostles so they won't go, whatever happens? And then the browsers, the people that come and try you every now and again, and that first, like if you were to look at a, a, you know, a, a sheet of figures and you might say, oh, they only ordered you know, a thousand pounds worth of business with us last year, they're not very important. But actually, they might be important. And how can you turn those browsers into, into loyalists? If you can't turn your mercenaries into loyalists, then use them to suit yourself. An experience that I had uh, in, my, in my company, so they'd be me and they'd be my customer contact. And then I'd go back to my company and say, oh, this is what my customers said, this is what they want, um, this is what they feel. And I'd go back to the CEO and the directors. And the customer contact would speak to all these different departments within his company. And they'd go to him and say, we want this or we want that. And uh, he'd relay or she'd relay that to me. And it would just be a nice, cosy relationship between the two of us. The problem is there's dangers of this type of relationships. And first of all, have I communicated the correct information back to, to my company? How many times have you thought, if you're not a salesperson, are they really telling the truth? <laughs> have they actually given me the correct information? Does the customer really want that, or is that just to suit them? The other problem is, has the customer communicated the correct information from his, inside his organisation back to me? Has the customer contact communicated the correct information to their boss? So if they've asked us something, I've given them back. Has he, has he or she then gone back to their boss or their internal departments and given the correct information? Or are they given some information that makes us look not so good? How do I know if the customer contact is focusing on their own objectives rather than their company's objectives? The other thing that could be a danger is what if I had a dispute with the customer contact? Because of that single relationship, if I have a dispute with them, what happens next? Where do we go from there? What happens to that relationship? What happens to that contract? What happens if I leave, which I did do? Also, what happens if the customer contact leaves? So all those are dangers of that kind of single relationship. What um, the CEO did as soon as I handed in my notice is they realised actually that's a big danger because if I went to another competitor or anything like that, I could just take away all the, the customers. So what she then did over the next 12 months is make sure that there was a multi-level relationship between our company and the customer. So, in other words, by me then going, it didn't really matter because there was a stronger relationship between the customer and our company. Uh, and that's basically what happened. So what you want, especially for your most important um, customers, is to be able to have lots of different contact points within them. Now, one of the things that we did as a, an organisation is um, we went for a rebranding exercise and we paid a marketing company and they went out and they spoke to our customers and they got some feedback from our customers because we didn't know, we thought we knew what we were good at um, and we thought we knew where our weaknesses were but actually the information that came back from the customers were different to what we thought. We hadn't realised that some of the reasons why they actually placed business with us um, and had we not done that exercise we wouldn't have known what our strengths were. And these are just some of the examples, web-based surveys you can use, written questionnaires, telephone surveys, focus groups, that's groups of eight to ten customers who come together um, and discuss uh, your strengths and weaknesses. Having face-to-face -face interviews. Customer panels, that's where you have smaller groups of customers that come together and, and they're specifically told the results of your panel is going to be shared with between 10 and 25 different staff members within our organisation. So it's important that the feedback you give us today, you know that you know, that could have an impact on the service. Another way is mystery shopping, and that's more about finding out what your customer's experience is. Everybody, I'm going to do a little session now around uh, working styles. And this is always, obviously, the focus is always about understanding your customer, because you know that the more you understand your customer, the better opportunity you have to deliver great service. Your customers are going to fall into two groups, roughly. Ones that 
think and behave like you so you know them and you recognize them and they're easy to be around and you can go for a pint afterwards or whatever it might be but ones that maybe speak your language or use the same tones and things as you and then ones that don't so they're much more difficult to deal with so what we do know is that successful companies have found ways of dealing with the ones that they find most difficult Okay, so that they can act differently when they're with them or they can act in a way that gives them a better opportunity to form a relationship with that customer and to service that customer. We used to do a lot of corporate entertainment and uh, one particular uh, event that we did is we took uh, a number of our customers uh, on the Orient Express from London um, to the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff and we watched uh, one of the Six Nations rugby games. And um, I was talking to one of the guys from one of the big networks a few days later, and he was saying to me, oh, do you know the thing that really stood out for me that day? So I thought, oh, I f I f you know, the, the experience on the Orient Express, you know, with the, the uniforms, the old fashioned uniforms, or maybe it was the rugby, the atmosphere. And he said, it was the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, the honest, that is an honest story. He said, it was the coffee. It's the best coffee I've ever had. And actually he was an example of someone I did find quite difficult to relate to because he had a totally different perspective to, to actually most people. Um, so, <laughs> so, and he was a, that's an example of the one that's a lot harder to relate to. So it's about understanding your style and then how you can use that, that knowledge to improve your relationship with your customer and try and improve your communication with that customer, which again will then add value in terms of the service and hopefully all of the other things move out. Because one thing I do know is if you get your service right, your customer service right, then all the other bits of the business um, seem to happen, like your profit might go up or your revenues go up or you know, whatever it might be. And it's about speaking that person's language. It's very important so that you can communicate with your customer in the way that they want, actually. So it's not about you, it's about the way that they want to do it. And there's four working start styles, okay? Analytical, driver, amiable, and expressive. Working styles do two things. They measure the, your emotional expressiveness of uh, how expressive you are. And they also measure the degree to which you are assertive. So the first one then, emotional expression, there's four types, verbally, so the language you use, the types of words you use and how often you use them, body language, key thing around body language, everybody knows that, the environment I like, this is another one around emotional expression, so tells what sort of person, if your desk is neat or if it's messy or you know, you've got inspirational posters or pictures of the kids or, this is assertiveness. So how much or how little you influence uh, and control the actions and the people around you and the opinions of people around you. So the important thing is that there's no style is better than the others. You know, they're all different. They all bring different things. But the key thing about it is if you have insight into your style, then it gives you that opportunity to understand how you can then relate to the person opposite you. Or if you understand yourself, you might want to think about what are they like. So you can judge for yourself and you can make some informed decisions about how's the best way to communicate with the person on the other end, because you understand their styles. You can't understand theirs if you don't understand your own. The message on this, of course, is better communications, better customer service. So we're all coming back to this thing. You know, you can only deliver improvement if you can understand what the problem is. So better communication. I was just going to say something. Uh, I was doing a, a customer service um, training day at, at one company and um, they all did it and basically they all ended up the same. They're all analytical. So I said, who recruited you? And it was the same person that had <laughs> recruited them all. So basically, and that's if you remember your Belbin team roles, it's about having a balanced team, having different views and opinions. Mm -hmm. But what the person had done is recruited someone in their own like. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting. I want to talk to you now about backup styles. So you know what style you are. And a backup style is about what you might do when you're under a bit of pressure. So it's normally the one that you're second in. You know, so this is the, what you might fall back on, your own individual style, when the stress comes up. So you, know, you want to be nice and normal and whatever you do, you're uh, nice and relaxed in your style and then suddenly it starts to come up. So I'm, personally, I move from expressive to analytical. This presents itself very nicely in that I write lists. So I know that I'm moving from here to here. The pressure's on, I need to list. I need to list everything that I need to do. And when the pressure's really on, I put things on my list that I've already done. So I can do a full Mr Bean and at the end go, oh, 
<laughs> so that's it. So it's about, it's normally your second one. So amiables, they tend to put their feelings to one side. We've got a few amiables in the middle. So they, you know, when the pressure's on, they will sacrifice themselves for the other view. So it's important, of course, because it's about learning about yourself and how you can be more effective. That's the key thing all the time. How can you be more effective in what you're doing? Becoming familiar with your working um, style and then you can view others in the same way. So, you know, if you're around your colleagues, you're asking for something, you're not getting quite the response that you thought you might, maybe you need to think about this. And then the key thing, of course, is becoming more familiar with your own customer and the way in which they work. The other good thing, of course, is if you can work out what your manager's working style is, then you can get on a lot better. Because once you learn how to manage your manager, life becomes much easier. So the next thing is about style stepping. So this is about adjusting your style to maximise the opportunities. So, you know, it's behaviours that you might perhaps use a little bit less frequently in, in normal sort of everyday activity. But if you are aware of it, it allows you to sort of um, emphasise different sort of areas of work. And, and again, it's, it's just another skill, if you like, or it's another, it's another opportunity for you to think about how you maximise communication. Because it's always about the more you can build a rapport with your customer in your, through your customer service, the better opportunity you have not only to service them, but to keep them, which is the key thing. And this is just sort of confirming that. It's not about being artificial. It's not about being pretending that you're something you're not. It's about understanding yourself and them and making that change so that you can build the rapport. And teamwork is another one. So you're trying to make sure you've got the team right around you. This is just another thing that you can do about preparing so it's about creating customer profiles. So in some situations, <coughs> you know, you can pre-plan a meeting. And if it's going to be a tricky meeting, that's not a bad way of doing it because it reduces your stress because you've given it quite a lot of thought. You know what you're going to go into. And if you can think about what their primary working style is and what's yours, then you can see how you might find some common ground around that and where, think about where there might be some challenges around it. Even customers that you've had for a lifetime, you really need to ensure that you treat everybody with the same sort of respect and give them the same consideration. So this is what it might actually look like. So you're trying to understand what your style is and then you're trying to work out what their style is. Now, number one is all about me. I talk too much. So, you know, if you've got that done, you know that. You need to try and teach yourself to listen more, two of these, one of those, all that sort of stuff. And then the areas that you might agree on and then the rapport strategy. So how are you going to get that rapport going with them? But again, coming back all the time, it's all about giving you some skills or some tools really for ensuring that your customer service is excellent all the time and you therefore maintain and keep those customers. Right, I know in the, um, the very first workshop, we covered transactional analysis to, a, to an extent. What we're going to do now is cover it in a lot more detail has anyone seen the film Inception, by the way? Right, quite a confusing film, but once you get to the end, you, f you figure out what's going on, yeah? That's what this is gonna be a little bit like, okay? <laughs> um, early in the 1900s, Sigmund Freud established that the human psyche was multifaceted and that each of us have, has war factions within our own subconscious. So that's some of the history. The human brain acts like a tape recorder. Uh, and whilst we may forget experiences, the brain still has them recorded. And the feelings and the events are actually locked together. The verbal communication, particularly face to face, is at the centre of human social relationships and psychoanalysis. And the person that's sending the stimulus is called the agent, and the person who responds is called the respondent. So just a little bit of terminology. Why are we covering transactional analysis? Um, by understanding the basics of it, it's going to give us a better understanding of why people communicate in a certain way. And one of the whole things about today is about understanding and knowing your customers so you can better serve them. The other value is it's going to help you choose a more appropriate style of communication to how you respond to your customers. As, as you know, there are three different ego states uh, with transactional analysis. And as a, as a human, we shift from one to another subconsciously. Now, these states aren't roles, but they're psychological realities which are activated by feelings. So the, the first ego state is, is parent. Now, the parent ego state develops by storing all the rules and the laws of the house. 
if you like, rules and laws of the, the house that you, were grown, that you grew up with. The second ego state is the child. And the child state develops by storing the internalisation of the response to the parental behaviours. So when a parent shouted at you or waved their fingers or frowned, you know, your reaction as a child. And the child either learns to seek parental approval or they rebel, and that's called an adapted child. The final ego state is adult. The adult is described as a, a data processing computer, uh, making decisions on logic and factual information and is not influenced by feelings. It also carries out probability estimating, how likely can I sort this, and it can devise solutions, develop contingency plans, and accepts the inevitable with equanimity. Some of your customers <coughs> may come to you from a parent ego state. Customers who come from this uh, area draw on criticism, they challenge attitudes, and they come from an authoritative position. Their non-verbal and verbal indicators are head shaking, arms folded, tongue clicking. I pay good money for this. It's a disgrace. I'm going to report you and they approach the situation from a position of, how dare you? Sometimes your customers might come to you from a child ego state. And when the child is activated, there's going to be strong feelings of being ignored, cheated, or being controlled or triggered. And in this ego state, the person will often feel powerless or rebellious. And some of the non-verbal and verbal indicators are temper tantrums, sulking, nail biting, no eye contact, nervous laughter. It's not fair. Why should I? I'm not moving from here until I get a replacement. Operating from our adult ego state means that we've made an objective, logical, autonomous appraisal of the situation. It's like placing your feelings on one side and thinking, okay, what do I want to get out of this communication? What is the logical thing, sensible thing to go back with? And when you're dealing with business, in a business situation, I'd say in relationship situations, you can only safely operate from adult. So parent, adult, child, parent, adult, child, stimulus and response. An adult to adult is the simplest of transactions. I'd like to exchange these shoes, please. That's a factual uh, request with no emotions intended to be attached to it. Would you tell me what's wrong with them? So that would be a factual response and there'd be no old wounds triggered in the, in the person. And that's called a complementary transaction, i.e. the response is appropriate. And if your customers complain from their adult ego state, it's a lot easier to solve their problems. It's a lot easier to understand what they're saying, what they want, and how to resolve it. When communication breaks down, it's usually as a result of cross-transactions, which are emotionally loaded. So I might complain from an adult ego state, your conditions of service state that delivery will be in 14 days. It's 24 days since I ordered. Would you please explain? Now, that's a factual and I've put no emotions into it. So that's an adult stimulus and I'm hoping for an adult response. An appropriate adult response would be, yes, delivery should be within 14 days. I'll check into why there's been a delay and come back to you as soon as possible. Can I have your order number, please? If it's heard as a parent criticism, then because of the transference reaction, there could be a child ego state response. You'll have to speak to X in dispatch, I don't deal with deliveries. So cross transactions may occur as a result of reading into comments or emotions or messages, hidden messages that are not actually there. Many people naturally fall into a, um, a groove of cross transactions. It's natural human emotions to, to go on the defensive. People will often go on the defensive. If you're blamed, if you feel that you're being blamed for something, it's natural to look for an excuse. It's just human nature. So for example, my telephone bill is incorrect, adult ego state. Why haven't you rung account? This is sales. And that would be a, a critical parent response instead of an adult response. And that would again lead to um, inappropriate exchanges until the original subject is lost. Here, the, tra the cross transactions come from the stimulus. What do you call this? It's disgraceful pointing to a cloudy pint of beer. And that would be, you know, a parent complainer trying to trigger a child response. Saying, oh, I'm sorry. But if, if you respond back as an adult, then the cross-transaction can be mostly stopped in its tracks. I'm sorry, sir, let me change this for you. You've got to remember to stay an adult. So when you're dealing with complaints, either from parent or child, stay an adult.
be aware, be tuned into parent ego states and child ego states. It's about avoiding the externalisation of your natural, your natural instincts, your feelings. And probably the main message is you can consciously choose your ego state. If you don't let your natural response come to the front and you think about it, you pause for a second, you can actually control it and then you can stay in your adult ego state. We're all individuals and we all take things differently and that's what you've got to try and be in tune with, with your customers as well. There was a study um, in the University of California in LA. They said when you're dealing face to face with your customers, which many of you do do, when you're communicating your feelings and attitudes, he then worked out the percentage of what was the most important aspect. What his findings were was 7% for the words used, 55% for body language, and 38% for tone of voice. So when you're dealing with someone face to face, it's your body language that can be the most important aspect. What about on the telephone? Hands up if you think it's the words used. So a couple of people think the words used are the most important. Tone of voice, everyone else? 18% words used and 82% the tone of voice. Your voice is made up of five different vocal qualities. First of all, it's your tone. And what the tone does is it expresses feeling or emotion. So you could have a, a, you know, a soft, voice or gentle voice and that's your tone. Inflection is emphasising certain words and syllables to enhance the message. So you're focusing on certain words to get your message across. The pitch is the third vocal quality and that's, that's how high or how deep your voice sounds. Obviously we've all got different natural pitches. Rate is how many words you speak per minute, so the speed that you're speaking at. And the final one is volume, so how loud or how soft the actual volume rate. This is an email that I sent our finance department. Unfortunately, there was a few areas that I could have improved on. What I've got is subject line is unclear and negative. If you don't have a good subject line, sometimes it's harder to find what you're looking for. Acronyms. Actually, do you really need to use those? It's not very professional sometimes, is it? Use of capital letters to make a point, would you shout at your customer? No. No closing or sign off. Uh, we missed a chance, to, or I missed a chance to end on a positive note. Uh, difficult to read, which we covered. Run on sentences, rambled. It's unfriendly, isn't it? It, it feels aggressive, the whole thing. And actually, it was a lack of a clear request. What was I actually asking for? Uh, unnecessary copying to other people, we've covered. You know, if someone's made a mistake and you copy lots of people in, what you're basically doing is venting your anger at that person, saying, look at you, you fool. And I'm going to make sure that everyone knows about it as well. Uh, overuse of exclamation marks we've got, and emoticons. Smiley faces to a customer you don't know might be a little bit unprofessional. But actually, you know, what we've talked about today is, is you know, understanding and knowing your customers. So sometimes it can be appropriate. It just depends on who your customer is and whether they will perceive it to be acceptable or not. Have you got the tone right? It's quite difficult um, in an email, as I said earlier, to, to get the tone right. So what's the best way to try to test whether you've got the tone right or not? Read it. Read it, yeah. Always read your emails. OK, I'm going to have a little chat to you, just a little short section here on upselling, cross-selling as well. 
if you have excellent customer service and excellent customer service people who are well briefed on your business and the requirements and the opportunities, they are always best placed to do some upselling or to do some cross-selling. We're talking about upgrading current products. Okay, so upgrading what you're already doing is upselling. A few examples then, supersize me, extended warranty. When you're buying your airplane ticket, you can pay a bit extra. Can't you sit in the aisles or whatever? Premium delivery options if you're buying a new house. You can choose your kitchen, upgrade your kitchen. Same on a new car. Hotels where you can book dinner there, internet, papers, cinema with seats, sweets and treats. If we look at what is cross-selling then. So cross-selling is about complementary products and upselling is about um, upgrading current products. The reason why we're discussing it in this environment is because one of the benefits of fantastic customer services is that you give yourself a big opportunity to cross-sell and upsell. Upselling has features and benefits. So a feature is a distinctive part um, of the product or the service, where a benefit is the value that someone feels from it. So the benefit is something that you can measure. It's fairly key, actually, that because often, you know, People can spend a lot of time and effort and they're talking about the features and then it's not getting the maximum opportunity or making the maximum opportunity. Right, just some uh, statistics on complaints or just some information. 91% of customers don't complain. Sometimes at a restaurant, you know, I've been with people and they've been going, oh, this is, this is really dry, this chicken is horrible, blah, blah, blah. Waitress comes around, does everything all right? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, because people prefer to avoid that conflict. So rather than complaining, they just move their business and then they never come back again. Why do customers complain? First of all, quality of product. And under quality of product, it could be inferior to expectations, it could be that it's poorly finished, a short lifespan, it could be faulty or you're misled. It could be to do with the attitude. Um, sometimes you might think, oh, you know, that company's more concerned with profit than they are with people. Poor product knowledge. How many times have you rang up a, a call centre saying, oh, this is wrong, ooh, uh, I don't really know about that, uh, I'll pass you on to someone else. Poor communication skills, we've been talking about communication today. One of the whole things today is about expectations of, of customers, and that can be service, expectations, wrong product, description of product, quality of product, speed of delivery, the communication they get, and price. There was a recent study as to why companies lost their customers. And there were five reasons in the this, in this study. 5% developed a good relationship with another supplier. 9% cheaper products elsewhere. 15% because they're unhappy with the service or product. 68% because of the poor attitude of the supplier. And 3% because they moved away. So if you get a complaint, it gives you a chance. It gives you a chance to put things right and then perhaps gain that loyalty of that customer because they'll see it as a good experience, a good customer service experience. Dissatisfied customers whose complaints are taken care of are much more likely to remain loyal and even become advocates than normal customers. The probability of selling to an existing customer is between 60 and 70%, whereas the probability of selling to a new prospect is between 5 and 20%. A 2% increase in customer retention has the same effect as reducing costs by 10% and it costs six to seven times more to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. Because we're talking about customer complaints, I've just done a list of top tips. Try to look beyond the rudeness and don't take it personally. That's all to do with transactional analysis. Be calm, don't mirror their behaviour. We've talked about our voice, being able to modify our vocal qualities. You know, if you can keep your tone soft, we've talked about tone, you keep your volume low and your rate slow, then you'll find that the person complaining will actually start to mirror your behaviour. Do use the customer name, but don't overdo it. I hate it when you're on the phone to someone and they keep saying your name over and over again. You say, OK, yeah, you know, yeah, you've obviously been told to use the customer's name to make it personal, but actually it gets irritating after a while. Listen carefully. How many times has that been said? Give some kind of feedback, yes, or mm -hmm, or some kind of noise, so the customer knows that you're actually listening. One of the biggest things that you need to do is to take notes because otherwise you're going to forget. When you're flustered, you forget. You, you don't remember quite so much. So make some notes, make some notes, understand what they're actually after and make some notes of it. Uh, empathy, we, met, we talked about empathy earlier. Apologise where appropriate. If it is appropriate to apologise, apologise. Stay focused on the problem. 
don't let it go on elsewhere. People that are agitated, people that are complaining, <coughs> might throw in facts and figures from a year ago, something completely random, and they'll try and take you off on a tangent. Assure the customer you're taking their complaint seriously. Establish the facts of the problem. Involve the customer. Discuss alternatives if, if necessary and agree a way forward. Uh, make sure you follow up on the agreed way forward. Don't assume anything and only promise if you know you can deliver. So service level agreements. So why do you want one? Well, first thing it does, it sets a baseline of expectation. All right, so this is what you are going to deliver and this is what it's going to be measured on often includes the KPIs, the things that you are going to be measured on and what your expectation is, what their expectation of what you are going to deliver and what you're going to meet every single month or every year or wherever it goes. It often includes the escalation route and this comes back to what Don was saying again, an SLA can often sort of put into writing the sort of relationships that Don was advocating earlier where you're not having a one-to-one -one, but there is a full sort of um, spread of relationships that are identified and there is an escalation route if something goes wrong and it can't be treated in that way. Always covers this, data protection, embargoes, confidentiality, force measure, all that sort of stuff will be in your SLA. So all of that is good and um, it does give you a baseline but it is actually the quantitative side of the relationship. So if you've got this you still need to um, have in your mind the qualitative side, all the other stuff that we've been talking about, about the feel-good factors, why people come to you again and again, so the different types of customers that you have, how you're going to relate to them. So you still need to have that on top, because this doesn't talk, none of, none of this talks about rapport with your customer, which is one of the big things that we talked about earlier. three pieces of advice I'd give a printer looking to improve customer service. First of all, take the time to know and understand your customers. Secondly, you need to understand what you're doing right with the customers as well as what you're doing wrong with the customers. And then thirdly, once you've got the answers to those two questions, implement some training. And for example, the BPIF offer lots of different types of training for customer service, some of which are funded by the government. Mm -hmm.